Uh, good morning. Um, it's uh, it's raining in Yorkshire. I don't know how it is with you. I'm going to talk for uh, half an hour or so about power score and the Brandon game of giving and asking for reasons. Uh, and I'm going to start talking about talk and scores and the nature of power. Um, I'm not talking about Shutterstock, although I've left rather a big credit to them on the, fir the first slide. Uh, and not th there are full references in the paper on the website, by the way. Um, so what this paper explores are ways in which the talk game, the game of giving and asking for reasons, involves the mutual power of the participants over each other. Um, <clears throat> the account uses the analogy of scorekeeping from David Lewis, which of course laid the foundations for Brandon's notion that in well-run conversations, as Lewis put it, there are scorekeepers of commitments, entailments, and entitlements in the game of giving and asking for reasons. Uh, Lewis's example was baseball, which is a Brit I don't understand. So here's a game I do understand, cricket. When you look at the scoreboard, you think, my God. Uh, I, my mum used to say, clear as muck. Um, scoreboards, though, for the aficionado tell you an awful lot of detail. Uh, but they do need more contextual information to know how the devil the game's going. Uh, but once you are an aficionado, not only do you understand that each of these elements is, uh, is part of the score in the game, Lewis argued that you could back formulate the rules of the game uh, with the scores and enough background knowledge. Um, I'm thinking of this as a sort of, uh, as like the three, the previous speaker was talking about three ply, I'm on a three stage account. Um, in a well-run conversation, as Lewis puts it, there's an end tuple of scores at the outset in a state of affairs, which are how we stand with each other in the world. Then second stage, we talk, there's a dynamic interchange of talk exchange, and kinesics, as, um, as Ray Birdwistle coined the, the phrase for body language. The opening scores may influence the course of talk and, and, to, and, and scores change, all sorts of other stuff happens. Finally, uh, we part, there was another st state of affairs with another set of scores. Uh, of course, uh, people do play baseball to win um, uh, and the game of talk isn't necessarily played to win cricket you can play for four days and have an honorable draw uh, now some talkers talk to win and we all know who they are but it isn't an intrinsic purpose of the of the conversation game but it is sometimes one of the purposes of the empowered because how else would we, it, the philosopher's favourite, how else would we ever get somebody to open a window? Or, or how, why else would we seize as we agree to open the window? Uh, shifting specifically to power, because Lewis's, I, I gather the scorekeeping paper is Lewis's most cited paper, uh, but people don't often go back to the, the uh, area where he talked about power. Uh, he introduced it in the context of accommodation, how interlocutors accommodate each other in the course of talk. Uh, and his example used the, the example of master and slave uh, and proposed that there is a boundary between some courses of action for the slave that are permissible and others that are not. And these boundaries then may change during talk. Um, uh, accepting the general notion of accommodation, I'm going to begin instead with an equality presumption, uh, which is a dyad just for simplicity's sake, between you, the utterer, and V, the vocalizer, who also, of course, are listeners in important ways. What is power in this context? Well, I'm not, I'm going to delve into it a little bit. I'm going to take Susan Fisk, who's a social scientist who's devoted a lot of her working life to the question of power, uh, her, her, her definition of power is asymmetrical control over resources. Um, so let's look at three issues in, in, that, in that definition. What resources are we talking about in talk? Of course, we are mainly talking about linguistic resources, 
like the power to speak, to be heard, to listen, to use or not use certain words, taboos, although they do, of course, interact with the non-linguistic resources, because when I ask you to open the window, your body moves to open it uh, or refuses, as the case may be. Um, and indeed, that's part of the Sellers Brandom pattern of, of how we get into and out of talk from perception to talk to action. Second issue with her, um, with her definition is about the basis of power, um, uh, which may be hierarchical, uh, institutional in a broad sense, including the family, say, as an institution. But she did add to that definition, status is social prestige. Now you can just have status by being on Love Island um, uh, or being famous. So sometimes status and power are hand in hand, but sometimes as in the case of experts and the hierarchy over uh, what to do with the coronavirus, for instance, sometimes experts and the hierarchy compete. Uh, and furthermore, within uh, well, when we think we're in an egalitarian state, um, something about our characters mean that sometimes some people exert power and some people defer. The third issue is uh, just what power is over or about. Um, now, for, for, uh, without going too far into the debate about power, uh, obviously, in, in talk exchange, power is power over or unpower over. And I'm accepting here Pansardi's idea that power to, which is sometimes thought of as a competitor to power over, is also relational, even if the social relations that that, that sort of power depends on are often left implicit. Um, just to start on talking about talk, here's an anonymous extract from the British National Corpus Spoken. Sometimes you want to be really unsociable, like a lot of the time I come from the work and all I want to do, don't want to talk. No, all I want to do is eat my food, do whatever I wanted to do for that evening. I'm trying from that ex extract to, to say talk is part of our form of life. We grant permission to talk or we, we seem to agree to listen without even thinking about whether we grant or agree. Um, we just do talk. And that's what makes the recalcitrant teenager such a dissident because those who refuse to talk by saying words out loud, I'm not talking to you, they're still playing the game, but not to engage at all. That would be to reject the talk game, to knock the chessboard off the table. So usually there's a background hum, I'm trying to say, of tacit permissions and obligations. What do the scores look like? While we've talked obviously about numbers and scoreboards, Lewis said that his scores were abstract entities. They may not be numbers, but they are other set theoretic constructs, sets of presupposed propositions, boundaries between permissible and impermissible courses of action, or the like. So some of this power score that I'm talking about will be about those permissible boundaries and some of them are hidden down there in the like, uh, like relative institutional position, status, force or compliance of character, physical strength. And within all this, equality is an option. I'm just glancing here as well at really following on from, from Lewis's talk about set theoretic constructs that we could formalize how, how this process is. Uh, and indeed this, this uh, example I've, I've uh, chosen uh, out of deontic logic is very much uh, parallel to what I'm saying. S is an initial state of affairs. Uh, S mark is the subsequent state of affairs. And there's T, a transition. Um, and a function goes from S to S1. But I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm sticking with ordinary words. Uh, so what happens uh, when, we, when we start talking? Um, uh, initially, there'll be norms to follow um, if we don't know each other. And if there aren't norms, um, 
uh, well, if, if we do know each other, then our history will start to inform what we're saying. And uh, as Brandon put it, um, the authority of norms depends on the nature of the author of the commands that make them explicit. Their bindingness derives from the interpersonal relation of superior to subordinate. And of course, we're talking as we go along about implicit as well as made explicit here. Uh, so in power terms, I've already touched on what our mutual standing will include, institutional arrangements, status, expertise, uh, coercion, uh, mutuality and character demeanor. When we begin an exchange um, in philosophy of language, uh, those opening exchanges are sometimes called phatic because they lack propositional meaning. But they count a lot, I think, in, in the establishing the initial score of power. Uh, we, what we think of as conventional greetings are, are actually invented in modern times. Hello was popularized by Edison um, to, for, in order to have a word for the telephone operator to say. And apparently Alexander Graham Bell preferred ahoy and greeted strangers to the end of his life with the word ahoy. Uh, Harvey Sachs's first example of conversational analysis was about hellos, was about how in eliciting the name of a caller, an operator could do that not by saying, what's your name overtly, but by subtly, implicitly exerting authority by first offering their own name. Um, all sorts of ways in which uh, beginnings count. Medics, have, for instance, have worked very hard on shifting the way they open their greetings. Um, Think too about kinesics, body language, and how that matters. Uh, then what happens in power talk? Here I've, I've just tried to summarize in this table, on the left-hand side are ways in which we uh, formally control talk, uh, but on the right-hand side um, are, are parallel ways in which uh, informally uh, talk uh, is, um, is, is controlled mutually. So, first of all, we do chair meetings. Parliaments have speakers, trade unions have conveners, societies have chairs. Uh, but when we're working informally, we do have a kind of mutual adjudication and assumption of power. I, I don't know about you, but I like to listen to children sometimes outside um, where I live, um, how they negotiate, that's not fair. Um, you're not the umpire, Th those sort of debates happen. Uh, secondly, turn taking um, in formal talk, that's pretty clearly controlled um, uh, and interruptions are deliberately limited. Now, inform informally, turn taking, as we know from quite a substantial literature and in defiance of how John Searle felt that it wasn't really rule driven, does seem to be in some ways rule driven in humans. We take turns in talking uh, and interruptions to those turns uh, often imply the assertion of power if they're, if they're interrupting to disagree, for instance. Um, although as Deborah Tannen points out, sometimes people interrupt out of sympathy to help you out to, to say, yes, mm, I think you meant so-and-so by that. Uh, so interruptions can be both positive and negative. Thirdly, focus in formal situations is expected and sometimes enforced. Um, I've got a little example in a moment of how informally we do think about the focus of talk, even in what seems like rambling conversation. And fourthly, there's politeness. Um, in, in Parliament, uh, uh, the British Parliament, for instance, you can't call a liar a liar, and somebody just got suspended for a day for doing that. The, there's an old line from The Guardian that I like, which says that in Parliament, you can't call a liar a liar because an MP would therefore, would thereby be telling the truth, thus contravening parliamentary etiquette. <laughs> um, and informally, as we know from the literature uh, of the last 30 years, um, there are very intricate interpersonal conventions, whether we call it politeness or rapport management. Um, another um, live chat. 
no, mum said the other day she was a bit upset. You kind of had a talk with her in the car or something. Yeah. What was that all about? Told her she was a bad parent or something. No, I wasn't saying that. I was just saying, like, how do I, how do I go into it? Um, well, don't talk about it if you don't want to. We were having a discussion, like, about childhood and, and things like that. Yeah. And I was saying to her how, like, she never... I hope you can see from this quite complex talk how in, in spontaneous talk people negotiate about what they're talking about. Um, power ebbs and flows as they do so. The effects of power talk. There are four forms of talk that are very clearly expressions or attempted expressions of power. Um, one is imperatives. Uh, which uh, Brandon himself explicitly mentioned, uh, orders and commands are not just performances that alter the boundaries of what is permissible or obligatory, they are performative. They do so specifically by saying and describing what is and is not appropriate. And this sort of making explicit is parasitic on claiming. I'm not making any comment on, on that last claim, but just referencing there. The second sort of clear effect of power talk is uh, if we think of from Austin onwards, uh, the marriage ceremony and so forth, uh, we make facts in appropriate ways. Um, uh, I like this, um, Beano is a British comic, if you don't know. Um, this, is, this cartoon is a riff on the fact that these two royal people uh, claimed that the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, um, informally married them a few days before the actual ceremony, which he then hastened to deny. Um, the third form of, of power talk, um, the transactions of societies and organisations. And the fourth, pacts between legal entities, contract, contracts, contractarian thinking, or blood brothers. These, these blood brothers, these forms of power talk have, uh, have big effects. Skipping that for time. Um, uh, let's look at three aspects of power in talk that uh, I think I, uh, as I go on with this project, uh, I want to explore more. The first one is time, that philosophy of language very often homes in on the individual speech act and therefore on the, the imperative as if that was what power was about. Um, and power does rest in the imperative, as we see. Uh, but persuasion and the expression of power mainly operate through a whole speech event or a series of speech events. Consider the persistence of the seller, for instance, the drip drip of maneuvers. I know when I was when I was a kid, um, my 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 first, joint first big encounter with power was being bullied. Um, and that, that happens in a sequence of events um, where small incidents multiply on themselves. Um, uh, secondly, um, there's a displacement of power um, in a sequence of events. The seller comes back after an initial refusal, as I was saying, the bully repeats their bullying, but also the victim misbehaves in another setting altogether. And, that's explicable by the power uh, question, by, by the previous exertion of power. The humbled lose their sense of personal authority in other contexts. Uh, and the third aspect of power that I think is worth exploring and we don't explore much is the field of authority. Because um, if someone says, please open the window, another may accede because the person making the request is, say, physically disabled and just can't reach the window. But that doesn't give the, the, the disabled person who gave that instruction power to run the seminar on Montague's grammar, which they don't know anything about. And nor, on the other hand, does the grammar tutor have the power to tell the disabled person to open the window and they physically can't. If that tutor did that, they would probably be criticised or sanctioned. Uh, so these are small examples, but I think they become bigger when we think about very substantial cases of abuse, where very often people have what we might call a legitimate field of authority, um, uh, uh, and they, they use that 
uh, authority from one uh, from one zone to exert authority uh, in another place altogether where it becomes illegitimate. Lastly, in my so I'm on this three phase thing. There were hellos, there was talk, and there's goodbye. And, and goodbyes, I think, really count in the exercise of power. You might have been sacked or promoted or insulted or praised, but in saying goodbye, you still often follow norms of farewells. He was rude and humiliated me, but I thanked him. There's a Tori Amos song where she repeats how insulting somebody was and then says, but I thanked him. And people do, they just do. Uh, and uh, uh, the danger with that for people who are bullied or victimized or, or whatever is that such endings are often cited subsequently by people say, well, they didn't say anything at the time. And that's again where I think power can best be understood over a sequence of speech events, because the recognition of what actually happened and the aftermath of that recognition can take a considerable passage of time. Uh, the one example I've got uh, time really to, to talk about is uh, a fairly well-trodden path, but I'd just like to, to, to go through it reflecting back on the, the Lewis Brandon model. The sexual consent is an area of talk where, as you can see, I like to quote from real life talk, but it's the sort of talk where there isn't likely to be a tape left running. It's intimate. Um, and it's also where a sequence of speech events is likely to be involved um, and where disputes arise, we're liable to re relying on testimony. Now, back in the 1990s, Britain, a judge agreed with a man who said that in sexual matters, a woman's no did not necessarily mean no. Uh, philosopher Jennifer Hornsby argued that what was at issue in that case um, is the re reciprocity of the speech act and that reciprocity resides in taking the words as they are meant to be taken in um, uptake, um, the word which comes from Austin and from Searle. Um, Every speech act to be successful requires uptake. Hornsby was giving an extra twist to that and uh, emphasizing reciprocity, taking her lead partly from speech act theory, but she was also motivated because at the time there was quite a furore about Catherine McKinnon's view that pornography silences women. Um, and here I think th that corresponds with my notion of displacement, that power exerted in one context in the dissemination of porn reappears in another, the, in the intimate encounter. Uh, and so the uptake of a speech act interacts with social norms, which interact with other forms of power expression. Uh, this on the right hand side uh, is a, the original Me Too tweet by Alyssa Milano, uh, which gave rise to the, the hashtag Me Too. Uh, so I'm suggesting that, that uh, uh, in consonance with my model, um, Harvey Weinstein had a field of authority film production, um, and he was, he was brilliant at that. Um, let's face it, he was a trailblazer. Uh, and in that field, working from that field, what he did was exploit the old norm, salacious norm of the casting couch to claim that this field of authority extended to the sexual arena. And in that, he resembled, as I was suggesting earlier, those religious and educational and familial figures who have been found guilty of abuse claiming one authority role as reason for exerting it in another. Um, uh, there was, uh, people may be less aware um, uh, that uh, earlier than Me Too, in the early 2010s, there was a Scandinavian scandal, which was known in, in translation as Talk About It, which followed allegations about uh, the activist Julian Assange and hinged on 
questions of 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 um, assault while uh, sexual assault while asleep. Um, uh, and this gave rise to a, a very big debate, mostly among Scandinavian women, um, and, and books and articles were written. Um, and dreadful as, as, the, the, as the events that they were recounting, the abuse that they were recounting was, the outcome one commentator regarded the subsequent public debate as positive feminist knowledge building. Uh, just as in the case of Me Too, Bianyas Dottir, who, who is the co-editor of the Routledge Handbook of Me Too, she called Me Too part of an epistemic resistance move, movement. Uh, I think that Me Too and the lesser known talk about it are in this sense um, interesting examples of how uh, public norms can shift thanks to public discourse. Um, and that that, uh, that shift in public norms um, uh, then can have an effect on individual speech acts and, and speech events. Um, uh, power as reason in talk exchange changes um, uh, as, the, as the norms shift. Uh, I've only been able to go through that one example. Uh, I think that there are there's, there's a lot of medical literature, and so I think there's there's stuff to explore about uh, the the relative status of uh, and power exerted in medical encounters. Um, uh, quite apart from all sorts of other areas where this model might be uh, tried out to apply. To summarise the model. I argue that we can fruitfully analyze power as a kind of score between participants in a talk event. And so it has three phases, the, the greetings, uh, the content and the farewells, and they are paralleled by an opening score reflecting the state of affairs and, and how we, we stand with each other. Then the X of that, exercise of that score and shifts in it during talk and thirdly, the outcome as a score that may continue to future talk events. And this power score is, I'm arguing, a component in the exchange of reasons that intertwines itself with talk exchange. Um, apart from exploring further examples, because this is the first outing for this set of ideas, uh, I want to go on uh, to see whether um, this model can shed light on the topic of persuasion in general. Um, anyway, this is, as I say, the first outing for this set of ideas. So I'm very, I'm very keen to get fee feedback. Um, uh, the full written papers on the conference website. Uh, and thank you for listening to me. Okay, so we'll take questions again. Yeah, Jeremy. Uh, thank you. That was that was very interesting. I, I enjoyed that quite a bit. Uh, I, I have a question about uh, a distinction between uh, power as a presupposition of speech acts and power as a consequence of speech acts, because a, a lot of your talk seemed to concern the latter. And I'm thinking about power as it's construed by people like, you know, Bourdieu or Foucault or people like that, whereby, you know, being, you know, if, if you want to put this in Brandomian terms, I'm thinking of, you know, Brandom's article, Freedom and Constraint by Norms, where, you know, a norm is, is, is a kind of power and that it constrains. And you know, from this perspective, being embedded in a network of power relations is a presupposition for being an agent in the first place and being able to engage in speech acts because only in so far as you are bound by norms are you capable of engaging in any sort of interactions at all. Um, but it's not obvious to me that, that you know, power in this kind of sense is part of the score. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of presupposition for there being scorekeeping. And, and I wonder also too, you know, if you're looking at the, you know, uh, the other ways in which power manifests itself, like in the, you know, with the Me Too movement. I mean, one of the one of the things about the Me Too movement is this is really an issue of epistemic authority. That when women report, uh, uh, you know, sexual assault or something like that, 
uh, that they're not granted epistemic authority as discursive partners and the reports aren't taken seriously. And I don't, I mean, I don't know, is, is, that, is that part of the score or is that just sort of a background uh, sort of inequity of power? Anyhow, I guess what I'm trying to say is there, there's all kinds of power relations that go into the discursive act that I'm not sure, uh, I guess I'm wondering, are, are these fruitfully represented as parts of the score or sort of as presuppositions for scorekeeping in the first place? Thanks. Well, it, I mean, that is a question um, I, have, I have fretted over. Uh, can I just mention, I mean, one, one absurd aim I did have was to deliver a half hour talk without mentioning the F word, which in this case was Foucault. I did manage not to mention Foucault the whole thing, but I think in subsequent drafts he's got to get a look in. Uh, so thank you for bringing him up straight away. Um, secondly, I do uh, I, I do take your point. I, th uh, I think these I, I think that I am looking uh, in in uh, in other uh, work at um, what might be the elements of score, and I think it would become plainer. If we if we started to try and break down what these score elements are, I think it, I think it would be complainer that power is one element in these score. Now, what I certainly um, what what I feel is a floor level is that power obviously provides a weighting for other scores. W E H G H T weighting. Um, um, I'm pretty convinced that that it is a score in this sense. It's um, and that there is a toing and froing, and that I mean, uh, uh, when we get into the subtleties of of power exchange, uh, even in a situation where somebody comes in with a presupposition of say institutional power, those without institutional power have some forms of power within any given talk exchange, and so there is a, an ebb and flow, which I think is reasonable to describe as as changes in the score. But thanks for the idea, because I I, it, I have been fretting over it. Kiro? Uh, yeah, um, um, my question was um, along similar lines, but um, thank you so much for um, your talk. I, I think it is um, really important work. And it, um, I was partly reminded of um, Pink, um, Pinkard's criticism of um, the spirit of trust um, in that uh, the relationship of the Romans to the Greeks um, isn't well described by the term trust. I guess um, that kind of um, brings back in um, Foucault and whether some of what we're calling trust might be called um, discipline. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure whether it's the fields of authority where the answer to my question lies. But I, for me, and, and again, this is yeah, uh, very much in tune with the last question, it feels like uh, it's the I thou intentionality of geontic scorekeeping, which is the problem because, um, yeah, in terms of what you call the starting score, I think that's a really nice way to frame it. Um, but the field on which the game of giving and asking reasons is played is already um, very constrained in certain ways. And this is something that um, Franz Fanon writes about really interestingly. It gives an autobiographical. Um, account drawing on um, Hegel's master slave dialectical and, and um, I mean to, to paraphrase you can say that um, for him as a black person in Europe he already had a score um, that was um, placed upon him and certain entitlements certain commitments and uh, black people did participate in the game of giving and asking for reasons but just playing the game was exactly the point that it didn't change anything, that um, playing the game was um, just reinforcing more of the same because it couldn't be imagined by the people in the game that things could be differently. And it's not to do with reasonableness, but it's partly because um, if they um, didn't continue the game, they themselves would lose power or um, would um, be punished. So if we are talking about power separately, then I think then like loss of power and gaining of power is a bit different to um, entitlements and commitments or, 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 or maybe it isn't. Um, yeah, the, those are kind of my thoughts. 
Well, thanks very much for the thoughts, Kirill. I mean, there obviously is a kind of intricate, uh, that's where one does need to bring in people like Foucault. Uh, there's an intricate uh, pattern of relations between small micro power and macro power. Um, uh, I suppose one reason why I wanted to bring in Me Too as my, as my big example is that to me, that is an example where an accumulation of micro cases um, uh, might in the end be, a, be a, a, a way of opening out debate and therefore eventually changing micro, the micro situation. I think um, uh, uh, Judith Butler is somebody else I, I didn't mention, but her, her formulation of, of, of performativity, I think, would be, for instance, that um, the very idea of performativity has in it the possibility of liberation, although uh, of greatly constrained, as Fanon would say, rightly say, but that, that, that and the, the Me Too is an example of the potential of liberation. But in a lesser way, my, my, the way that doctor patient encounters have changed over years is a very, very gradual shift, for instance, towards patient centeredness. And that is that's where uh, a, a, a million micro encounters are shifted by public discourse about power. Is there a question down here? Yeah, yeah please. And then Yako. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I wonder if um, analyzing uh, the social interchange of reasons in terms of power relations doesn't um, distort or maybe in, in many cases just leave out the epistemic dimension of giving and asking for reasons. So consider um, two different cases of a professor interacting with a student. Imagine that there's been an assignment to just explain, I don't know, some philosopher's view on something or other, explain what goes on in a certain piece of text. And the student has written something which just gets it completely wrong, I don't know, describing Descartes as a physicalist and <laughs> goes on from there. And in the first case, um, the faculty member sits down with the student and the text and goes through it systematically and tries to explain, here's what's going on in this passage and see what he says here and so on, until the student comes to understand what's going on there and sees why what he wrote was mistaken. And in the second case, um, what happens instead is the professor says, hand in that again, and I'm going to fail you. Here's what you need to write, write it or else. <laughs> now, <laughs> the second case is a, you know, just brute exercise of power. Um, but if one looks at the first case and one's thinking about power relations, well, then certainly the professor has power over the student and the professor is using the power of the student in order to get the student to say something different. The two cases look alike if you're just looking at it from power alone. And yet it seems to me that there's something importantly different epistemically going on in these two cases. And it's not that power plays no role in what you might call a good case. Um, <laughs> Um, but rather an epistemic analysis of what's going on will um, uh, look at different features of that interaction. And if one just looks at it from the perspective of power, one misses those important differences. Well, thanks very much. I, I mean, that does give me the opportunity to say that while I have singled out power as an element in this talk, um, but I am, th I am thinking of it in the context of a number of elements of score of which power is one. Um, so that's, that's my first point. Uh, the second is, I think that, I mean, uh, I think your example is very illuminating because uh, the, the, the professor who, 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 gu who guides the student uh, by reason, but also by virtue of their power relation with the student um, is, is, uh, is, uh, does, does reach um, 
a, prefer, a preferable epistemic state, I think you're arguing, uh, for the student than the, than the second case where of authoritarianism. And I completely agree with that. And so I, I agree that a, any account has to show that. And uh, I'm sorry if I didn't show that. Um, it, it reminds me of, of a, a, in the written text, but something I didn't have time for, uh, I make a glancing reference to a paper by Kukla a few years ago about sexual, sexual talk, where she talks about how we overemphasize uh, we in the we've we've talked too much about um, these the cases of lack of consent, and what we need to talk is about what happens when it works. Um, and I think that your first example is a, an eminently good example of that. And, and her her account, their account, I beg, I beg their pardon, their account is is good in that we need to look at how how. Uh, the exercise of power in some cases is benevolent when married to um, epistemic justice. So thanks for the point though. I think I do need to make that much clearer. Jaco. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, I think the connection between conversational norms and power is a good one and um, will pursue, but uh, my question concerns the sort of status of these conversational norms. So do you think that these, uh, there is a sort of a sui generis normativity going on at the conversational level, so the norms are genuine, so to speak, or do you think that um, uh, they can be reduced to something, something more, uh, more basic? And there's sort of two, two exp uh, examples from literature, which I think could be a good contrast here. For example, the uh, book called Explaining Norms by Jeffrey Brennan and some other authors from 2013 seems to give an explanation of social normativity that um, basically works by explaining norms as expectations of norms of what people believe that other people believe in the community should be done. And that's sort of a sort of a reductive account of the conversation. It could be used as a reductive account of conversational normativity. On the other hand, there's the book by um, Quill Kukla and Mark Lance uh, from 2009, the Yo and Low book. Yo and Low, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, and, and the, it, it's, it's, it's my understanding that they offer a sort of a more Brandomian sui generis account of these conversational norms, which uh, they, they are irreducible to, uh, for example, the beliefs and uh, second order beliefs. So what's your uh, sort of status with, between these two alternatives? Uh, I, I, to be honest, I haven't got a firm view. Um, I, I'm certainly much more inclined to the Brennan view that that while I'm I'm picking out power because I think, um, especially in where I come from in, in, in analytical philosophy, it, it's not explored much. So I wanted to highlight it. Um, but I do think it fits with uh, some other sets of sets of norms in in the way that that, that you've outlined. So um, I don't know whether reducing would be exactly the word I'd use, but that that it's that it it, it fits might fit systematically into an account of norms in general. Um, uh, and so uh, and I think that that fits better with the um, the I thou as somebody a, a previous questioner put it uh, the I thou situation of of talk um, uh, that that a number of a number of things are in play. There are, for instance, kind of emotional norms, and then uh, the ways that people in any given encounter differ from the norm. Uh, I, I think those are very, those are interesting alongside power norms, and and they can be analysed in a parallel way. So that's 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 my rough and ready answers for now. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so uh, we're at the end of this session. Let's thank Alan again, and we'll take a 10-minute break and start at 12.20. Thanks. Thanks, Preston. Thanks, everyone. Okay, welcome back. We have our uh, final talk.